Hello again, calculus students. It's good to see you again. Today we're going to be talking about differentials and linear optimization. So the idea behind today's lesson is that when a function is differentiable at a point, if you zoom in on the graph of the function at that point, the function is going to look just like a straight line. And this has a lot of application, it turns out, because if you have a really complicated function, maybe the computer has a hard time plugging numbers into it. Well, you can approximate that complicated function with a straight line, and straight lines are very easy for computers to process. And so that'll give you a, an efficient way to approximate the values of the function to whatever degree of accuracy that you want. So today we're going to learn how to do that. Greetings, calculus students. Today we're going to talk about linear approximation and differentials. So here's the idea basically behind everything that we're going to talk about today. If you have a function y equals f of x and it's differentiable at a point x equals a, then when you look at the tangent line to that graph of y equals f of x at that point x equals a, well, it's going to be a very close approximation of the original function y equals f of x. In other words, when you look at the tangent graph of the tangent line at the point of tangency to the curve, you can't tell much difference between the tangent line and the curve itself if you zoom in pretty close. And so then that tells us that we can use the equation of the tangent line to approximate what the original function is doing near that point of tangency. And that can be pretty handy because the equation of a tangent line is really simple. And the original function may be sort of a complicated function that's hard to compute. So using the, the, um, the equation of the tangent line may offer a simplification. Okay, so let's talk about how we get a linear approximation. For example, if you're looking at y equals x squared at the point x equals 1, we could certainly find the equation of the tangent line to the curve y equals x squared at that point x equals 1. This is the sort of thing we've been doing all along. So we know that the slope of the tangent line is just going to be the derivative of x squared evaluated at x equals 1. So that would be 2 times 1 equals 2. And we have a point of tangency here. That's just the point 1 comma f of 1. In other words, 1 comma 1 squared, which is just 1 comma 1. So we have the two ingredients that we need here to get the equation of the line. We have the slope of 2, and we have the point of tangency. So we get our equation of the tangent is y minus the y-coordinate of the point of tangency equals the slope, which is 2 times x minus the x value at the point of tangency. And because we want to use that tangent line as a function itself, what we want to do is solve for y on this thing. And we'll solve for y and get y equals 2 times x minus 1, and then add 1. And I think it's sort of standard for us to call this thing here L of x. But we'll get to that soon enough. Anyway, so we know how to find the equation of a tangent line. Finding the equation of the tangent line is pretty easy. You just have to find the derivative, plug in the point of the x value of the point of tangency and then you know we practiced this a lot this quarter you know we could check our work here let's go to desmos and see so i could put in f of x equals x squared and then our tangent line i want to call it l of x for line it was two times x minus one plus one that looks about right so the idea behind linear approximation is is like maybe the the green function here the x squared is think of it it's like some complicated function right it's really hard to compute but we know that that line, a line is always easy to compute. And if we zoom in at, around that point of tangency at 1 comma 1, when you start zooming in far enough, boy, it gets, here you can see the, the green curve and the purple curve are starting to diverge dirge from one another near the edge of the window. But if we keep on zooming at some point within the entire window, you can't tell much difference at all, if any, between the tangent line and the original curve. So if I use the tangent line on this sort of scale to approximate what the function is doing, I'm going to get a really good approximation, right? So that's the gist of it. And we can see I replicated that sort of thing down here in a sequence of pictures, just so you'd have something in your notes later. But the idea is zoom in around the point of tangency. You can't tell the difference between the original curve and the tangent line anymore. Therefore, the line serves as a good approximation of the original curve so long as you stay close to the point of tangency. So let's generalize what we did in this previous example. So instead of looking at the function y equals x squared, I'm just going to look at a general function, y equals f of x. 
And I'm going to suppose that our function f prime of a exists. Maybe I really need to say that f prime of x exists on an interval containing a. I need the function to be relatively well defined around this point of tangency, so it's not good enough for just the derivative to be defined at a. And I really need the derivative to be defined all around a. But that's okay. That describes almost every function we ever deal with. And so how do we get the equation of the tangent line? Well, same as we did before with y equals x squared. Um, we know that the tangent slope at the point in question here, a, is f prime of a. And we know the point of tangency is a comma f of a in this general setup. And so then our tangent line equation would be y minus f of a equals f prime of a, that's the slope, m tan, times x minus a. And then I could solve for y, y equals f prime of a times x minus a plus f of a. So I'm just adding f of a to both sides of that equation. And I'm going to call this thing L of x, just for to remind you that it's an equation of a line, so L for a line. And we're going to, th this, this is our, what we call linear approximation of f near x equals a. That's what's in this box typed up neatly down here. Linear approximation of f at a. Just that same formula that I wrote down a second ago. But the point is, it's just the equation of the tangent line where you've solved for y, so that you get a function. Let's see how you can use this to approximate a function near some specified point. So in this particular example here, I've got f of x equals the fourth root of x, which we could, if we wanted to, just write that as x to the one-fourth. And we're looking at what's happening around the point x equals a. I want to find, the in part a of this problem, I want to find the linear approximation l of x of that function at a equals 81. 81 is kind of a nice number. It's a good a value for this function because the fourth root of 81 is nice. It turns out to be just exactly equal to 3. And then we're going to use that linear approximation L of x to approximate the value of f of 85. So f of 85 is the fourth root of 85. What's the fourth root of 85? I don't know. It's some weird decimal number. But I can get it from this, I can get an approximation of it from this linear function pretty easy. And then at the end, I'd kind of like to just compare what's the actual fourth root of 85 versus this approximation that I got and take the difference so I'll get the error in the approximation. So let's do this thing. So for a, I'm going to do my L of x equals f prime. Now my a value is 81, so I need to do f prime of 81 times x minus 81 plus f of 81. So there's two things I need to fill in here. f prime of 81, I need to figure out what that number is. And then separately, I need to figure out what f of 81 is. But both of these are pretty easy tasks. I could just go over here to the side and do them pretty fast. Let me do a little scratch work section over here. So we know f prime of x, well, let's write down what f of x is first. f of x is x to the 1 fourth. So from there, I could go ahead and do what f of 81 is. I already told you what the answer is, though. That's 81 to the 1 fourth power, or fourth root of 81, which is 3. And then f prime of x is 1 fourth x to the negative 3 fourths, using the power rule. So then f prime of 81 would be 1 fourth times 81 to the negative 3 fourths. So that's the same as 1 fourth times 81 to the 1 fourth, and then raise that to the negative third. So that would be 1 fourth of th times 3 to the negative third. So that's 1 over 4 times 27, which would be 1 over 108. f prime of 81 is 1 over 108, and f of 81 is 3. So substitute in what I just figured out, and this comes out to 1 over 108 times x minus 81 plus 3. Okay, that's it. So then <clears throat> part B, I want to use L of x to approximate the value of f of 85. Well, the idea is that f of 85 is approximately equal to L of 85. And L of 85 is really easy. I just put 85 right in here for x, right? So I get 1 over 108 times 85 minus 81 plus 3. So that's 4 over 108 plus 3, which I could simplify into one fraction. 3 would be... 324 over 108, so 324 plus 4 is 328 over 108. Of course, I'd like to plug that into a calculator and get a decimal value, and I will do that in just a second. But for part C, it's asking, what is this error in this approximation? 
So what I calculated in part B here was an approximation of the fourth root of 85. So the error will be the actual fourth root of 85. Well, maybe I'll say it this way. It's f of 85, the actual value, when you plug 85 into the function, minus this approximation, L of 85. In other words, that's the fourth root of 85 minus this 328 over 108. And we're gonna need to plug that into a calculator to see what that actually works out to, which I've thoughtfully done ahead of time. And let's see what it comes out to here. Here is your fourth root of 85. And here is our approximation, L of 85, which we know works out to actually be 328 over 108. And then if you subtract those two, you get this E at the bottom here. And check it out. Those two numbers are so close to no one another that they don't differ from one another until you get to the fourth decimal place. So our fractional approximation of the fourth root of 85 was pretty good. Again, it may be, you may think, this seems kind of dumb. Why would I bother with trying to approximate the fourth root of 85 if I can just directly plug fourth root of 85 into a calculator, why go through this extra step? And the answer to that question is, is that sometimes in situations where the original function is much worse than the fourth root of x, it's like some really horribly nasty um, function algebraically, and you're wanting to put a number into that really horrible function, but not just once, but you're going to want to put a number like you're going to do these sort of approximations millions and millions of times. Like maybe think of a computer that's sort of, it's getting some input in real time, like a stream of numbers that it's got to plug into this function. And th the original function may be very difficult to evaluate, like when you plug numbers into it. So if you use this linear approximation instead, you'll get a great speed up in the speed of the program that you're running. And, and you'll get results that are, you know, within several, you know, like maybe you get several decimal places of accuracy, and maybe you only need one or two decimal places of accuracy, and this is good enough. So that's the sort of situations where this linear approximation sort of thing arises. Here's another example along these lines. It's the last one, but with a little less structure so that you have to kind of figure out how to do the linear approximation more on your own. So here we want to approximate cosine of 31 degrees. Now again, I understand that you could just plug the cosine of 31 into a calculator and get an approximation that way, but again, we're learning a technique here that can be used in specialized settings, so you have to go with it for a bit. Anyway, so here we're not being told what the A value is where we're going to base our approximation. Like In other words, we're not being told what's the point of tangency that we have to look for, and we're not told what the function is and all that sort of stuff. But we kind of reason like this. It th makes sense that, first of all, our function that we're trying to approximate is the cosine function. So our f of x is going to be cosine of x. And the base point, or if you're thinking about the equation of the tangent line, the point of tangency, um, we need to pick an a value that works nicely when you plug it into the original function and that function's derivative. Well, what number that's close to 31 degrees is really nice in trig functions? You guessed it, 30 degrees. So we'll take our a to be 30 degrees. Problem is, Trig functions don't like degrees that much when you're doing calculus. So we need to convert, convert this over to radians. So that's pi over 6. Okay. And then in that case, 31 degrees will be 31 times pi over 180. So we'll need to use 31 pi over 180 instead of 31 degrees in our calculations. So then what we're going to do is find the linear approximation L of x using a equals pi over 6. So L of x will be f prime at pi over 6, that's our base point, times x minus pi over 6 plus f of pi over 6. Okay, so let's go over here to the side. Our function is f of x equals cosine of x. So what's f of pi over 6? That's cosine of pi over 6. And cosine of pi over 6 is square root of 3 over 2. And then we can do what's f prime of x. Well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine of x. So f prime at pi over 6 is negative 1 half. Sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. So if we substitute that information into the linear approximation formula over here, we get negative 1 half times x minus pi over 6 plus square root of 3 over 2. That's our linear approximation formula, just L of x in general. And so now I want to approximate, so now cosine of 31 degrees, that's really just f of 31 pi over 180, but we know that that's approximately 
L of 31 pi over 180, which, according to our formula we just calculated here, that would be 1 half times 31 pi over 180 minus pi over 6 plus square root of 3 over 2. This is just some number that we can plug into a calculator, right? That's supposed to be an approximation of cosine of 31 degrees. So let's just see what happens when we plug this into a calculator. Is this a good approximation? Okay, this number right here is cosine of 31 degrees. So the actual value. This number is L of 31 degrees, the approximation. And you can look at those two numbers and see, wow, they are really close to one another. In fact, when you subtract one from the other, the difference, you don't see a difference until the fourth decimal place. So this is the error. So not too shabby, right? It's a pretty good approximation. So hopefully at this point you're convinced that tangent lines can be used to approximate the value of the function to a pretty good amount of accuracy. Of course, the amount of accuracy that you're going to get depends on how close the number you're plugging in to the linear approximation is to the point of tangency. So if you plug in a value of x that's really far from the x value where the point of tangency is, you're going to get a bad approximation, but it often works pretty well. The next thing we're going to talk about is how do you approximate how much a function changes over an interval? It's, going to, it's a very similar idea to what we've already been working on. So previously we've been working on how do you approximate the value of a function value near some point of tangency of the tangent line. And, but now we're more interested in not what a specific value of the function is, but how much the function changes over an interval. So let me try to depict that over here in this graph here. We've got this point of tangency here when x is equal to a, and then we move away from the point of tangency a certain amount, and we get some new point I'm going to just call x. So this amount that we move away we'll call delta x here. And you can see the blue line in blue there is the tangent line at the point where x is equal to a. And then the black curve is just your function. Now look at this red bar here. What is that measuring? The red bar here is measuring how much the actual function rose as x changed from a to this arbitrary point at x here. This red bar here, I'm going to call that delta y. So the little triangle is called delta, by the way. So delta y is just the actual change in f as x changes from a to x. But we know that that blue line really is indistinguishable from the black curve whenever a and x are pretty close together, right? So we can measure that green distance here. That's This green distance is how much that blue line has risen from the point of tangency. Let's call that one um, delta L. So that's how much L changes as x changes from A to x. And the thing to notice here is that delta L approximates delta Y. So let's write down, let's give some formulas to these quantities. So delta X there, the blue horizontal amount, that's easy to see what that is algebraically. That's just x minus a, right? Delta y, the actual change in f, that's just going to be the y value on the curve at that point, x, so that's f of x, minus you know, the y value at the point of tangency, so that's minus f of a. And then delta l is similarly just how much l was at the end, so l of x, minus L of A. Now we can simplify that because we have a formula for L of X. Remember L of X is F prime of A times X minus A plus F of A. And then you have minus L of A. Well, what's L of A? Well, L of A is just the Y value at the point of tangency. That's just F of A. And so that simplifies just to F prime of A times X minus A. And so the thing to observe here that's important, the actual change in the function delta y is approximately the same as this delta L. So this is what's important. So i.e. what this observation is telling us is that delta y 
is approximately f prime of a times delta x because that, remember, x minus a there is really just delta x. And then there's just a little terminology here that traditionally we have used when talking about how much a function changes. We use these words differentials. So dx and dy here are what we call differentials. So when you see the delta x and delta y, we, we just call those change in. So delta, delta just reads change, whereas d reads differential. But they're really the same concept. So when I say dx, this is really just x minus a. It's the same as delta x. And dy is f prime of x times dx. It's a slight variation. It's basically the same, though, as delta y, where you have just a is equal to x. I'm sorry, same as delta l. And so the idea is that dy is approximately delta y. Like dy is an approximation of delta y. So if we want to get an approximation in the change of the function, we can use this dy and dx stuff to talk about it. So let's see an example here. So imagine you have this big rubber ball and it's getting inflated and its radius changes from 5 feet to 5.1 feet. And remember that the volume of a sphere here is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So the first question is asking us to find delta v. So this is the actual change in the volume. And then part b is asking us to calculate dv, which is an approximate change in the volume. And of course, we'll want to compare these two things and see that they're pretty close to one another. So delta v is just how much literally exactly on the money did the volume change, which might be a hard computation to do sometimes. But it would just be v evaluated at 5.1 minus v evaluated at 5. And so v at 5.1 would be 4 thirds pi times 5.1 cubed minus then you'd have 4 thirds pi times 5 cubed. And we'll plug that in a calculator here in a second and see exactly what it comes out to. But that's how you would go about computing it. And then dv, on the other hand, okay, so we need to think about what our point of tangency is. Well, it makes sense since 5 is the nicer number to plug things into. We'll use that as our base point A. So this will be v prime evaluated at 5, our base point, and then times our dr. And dr here is how much the radius is changing as you move from 5 to 5.1. So that's v prime 5 times 0 0.1. Now what is v prime of 5? Well, I think you can look up there at the formula for v and differentiate with respect to r and see that you get 4 pi r squared. So this would be 4 pi times 5 squared times 0 0.1. And then we'll plug that into the calculator and see what we get. And let's compare these two things here. Okay, so here's these values after having plugged them into the calculator. This value here is delta v, and this value here is dv. And you can see they're not too far apart from one another. You know, they're within like you know, almost a one half of or 0.6 of one another, something like that, something on that order. So it's not a huge discrepancy between the two. But that's the idea of what dv does. dv approximates how much that function changes over an interval. Oftentimes, though, if we're not thinking about specifically like in some sort of like applied situation or if we're not thinking about change in the function explicitly, the differentials are also important just sort of as a symbolic thing. And I'll explain why in a little bit. But remember, we have this formula dy is equal to f prime of x times dx. That's just the formula for how you do a differential. And so if I give you a specific function, f of x equals e to the 2x, well, I would just go, okay, so in this example, let's say y is equal to e to the 2x. So then to get the differential dy, I just take the derivative of what y was, so that'd be e to the 2x prime, and then multiply by dx. So dy would be 2 e to the 2x times dx. And I'm not going to do anything in particular with the, D, like the dx and say, oh, dx is like 0 0.01 or something like that. I'm just going to leave it in this sort of algebraic form. If I needed to calculate how much y changes, given a specific amount of change in x at a particular point, I could plug in a particular value of x and a specific amount of change dx. But just symbolically, this is what you get. I want you to just notice something, though, here. Like, notice. dy 
equals 2e to the 2x dx, I want you to divide both sides by dx, and you get dy over dx equals 2e to the 2x, which is exactly f prime of x, right? So remember, a long time ago, we said dy dx and f prime of x are the same thing. So this notation that we're using for differentials conveniently agrees with our, different, our um, differential notation for derivatives, the dy dx stuff. So, and it also tells you that this thing that we were just treating as the derivative as just this sort of one quantity, it really is a fraction. There's a reason we had a fractional notation. It really is a fraction. We can think of dy and dx as separate quantities. dy is, or dx in the denominator is an amount of change of x, and then dy is the corresponding change along the tangent line. So it really is a ratio. And here's a little peek into the future. I can't help myself a little bit. You use these differentials a lot when you get into calculus two and beyond. Now, I'm gonna point at something here that it, it won't make any sense to you necessarily if you, haven't had, if you haven't seen this concept before. And it doesn't matter. I don't want you to worry about what this means so much. But this is a fact from calculus two. This would read the integral of sine of u du is equal to negative cosine of u plus c. All it really means is if you take the quantity that's on the right hand side and you differentiate it, you get the function that was inside this weird symbol before. It's kind of like doing the, it's like doing differentiation in reverse. It's called an antiderivative. But in any event, don't worry about what that means right now. That's not really the point of this. I want you to just accept what I have in yellow as a fact, okay? It's just this weird relationship. If I accept that as a fact, using differentials, I can solve the next kind of question. It would read, find the antiderivative of 2x times sine of x squared. Well, the way it would work is I could say, well, let u equal x squared. Then the differential of u, just like we did a minute ago, all you do is you take the derivative of that function on the right, 2x, then multiply times d of whatever its variable is, so dx. Now look, inside this integral, if I put a lasso around something here, that stuff that I just circled in blue is exactly 2x times dx. In other words, it's du. And also, x squared here, we already said that was just u, right? That's our substitution. So if we make this substitution and we convert everything from x's into u's, it becomes integral sine of u times du, which is really cool because if you accept that the formula in yellow is a fact, then this becomes negative cosine of u plus c. c there is just an arbitrary constant. It doesn't matter what constant, any constant will do. And then you just remember at the end here that u is actually x squared, so this is negative cosine of x squared plus c. And you can actually check that your answer is right by differentiating it and see if you get the function that you started with inside that weird symbol out there, the integral symbol. So if you check the derivative of negative cosine of x squared plus c, okay, the derivative of negative cosine would be positive sine, and then you have to use the chain rule and multiply by 2x, and then the derivative of the constant is zero. So this is just 2x sine of x squared, which you'll notice is exactly the function that was inside that thing to start with. So that tells me that I did the process right. You're going to find yourself in the next calculus class using these differentials in their sort of symbolic form a lot to manipulate these computations algebraically. So they're not all about calculating how, how much a function changes. I mean, that's under the hood there somewhere, but really it turns into an algebraic process. And so, and it's kind of cool because when you do a differential, all you really do is doing a derivative where you've got the, you know, the dx, the du and the dx sort of on separate sides of an equation instead of written as a ratio. But anyway, that's a little peek into the future. And I think I will stop there for today. And I'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye now.